So in the next videos, you are going to hear about Voltaire. Voltaire is a name that this writer made up for his uh, career as a writer, Voltaire. Uh, he is the most famous French writer of the 18th century. Uh, and along with Rousseau, who we'll talk about in later videos, with those two, you have the two most influential French writer thinkers of the 18th century. Voltaire becomes influential just by way of a long career of writing all different kinds of books, all different kinds of subjects, philosophical essays, letters on travels, a series of fascinating letters he wrote from England, uh, reporting back to France what England was like, telling P Frenchmen how great England was. Then uh, he writes novels, short novels, especially Candide, which is a huge success. And someday you should all read Candide. It's an easy read. It's a charming, delightful uh, 18th century fable about someone who believes that everything that is, is the way it should be. Everything is the way it should be. So that is Candide. Uh, Voltaire was born in 16. 94, he lived to 1778, so 83 years, long, long career, many, many, many books, and huge influence. Why does he have so much influence? Because he gives the whole of the 18th century, especially French public, a view of enlightenment thinking, that the universe has an order and that we can use our reason to discover that order. And all his writing was in service to that basic idea. Here is our hero tonight, Voltaire, François-Marie Arouet, born in Paris in 1694. Now just think back to what we just talked about. What's the date of the Royal Society? 1660. So here's a boy born 30 some years later in Paris and someone who is going to be very, very much interested in the sciences and who's going to do scientific research himself and who will go to England and study England and write a book about what it was that made England work. See, what, why was England successful? That's, he's going to write a book about that. All right. So here is Francois-Marie Arouet, um, youngest of five children, uh, I think two of his siblings died young, and so he grows up with two siblings. Father was a, a notary, which would be a kind of a lawyer-CPA combo. This was one of the important jobs in, in all of Europe. Uh, and you're kind of a tax expert and a kind of a law expert. You're not a lawyer, but you're sort of like it. So he certainly dreamed that his son would become a lawyer. That was the number one thing that you wanted all your sons to become, and a whole long list of famous uh, 18th and 19th century French intellectuals had fathers who wanted them to be lawyers, and then most of them didn't become lawyers. His mother was a very witty, charming, uh, and there at the bottom of the screen you see how he adopted Voltaire, and you can see that if you write his name in, in uppercase Latin, and you add the letters for the younger, then you have R-O-V-L-I, and if you mix all those letters together, you can get Voltaire. Mother Marie was uh, somewhat noble, so that would mean sort of minor nobility from Poitiers, from Poitou, so from the southwest part of France, and um, connected to uh, the controller general, and uh, so access to the court and access to uh, fancy people, famous people. Uh, vivacious, sprightly, witty. People adored her. People loved to come to the house, so she invited people all the time and entertained people. So it was a kind of a French salon of wit and charm. And he sees this. He grows up with this. He adores his mother, is very much impressed by her. And he thought that he got all his sort of wit and everything from his mother. He probably did. He was still pretty young when she died, so he, of course, raised her up in his mind above probably into 
kind of sanctity and, and adored her and held on to her memory. Uh, his father was certainly good to him and good to the family, just that he wanted him to be a lawyer. Now, education, well, he had as good an education as any young man could possibly have in France, and that is Paris and the grand old Louis Le Grand, and now called Lycée, in those days they called it a collège, uh, right in the middle of the Sorbonne neighborhood. Uh, let me go forward to the map before I tell you. You can see where it is. It's, of course, Left Bank. It's the great old part of the Left Bank, which is the university. It is the old university world up on the hill. This is uh, Mont saint Genevieve, uh, so mountain of the one of the great saints of Paris, saved her life, saved, saved Paris in 451 by organizing to resist the Huns. And so this mount has a whole uh, university concentration that includes the Sorbonne, which is a part of the university, and then all these blocks, all these buildings around this different neighborhood are different parts of the University of Paris. So this whole neighborhood, down to the river, over to the Luxembourg Gardens and back into the Sorbonne Botanical Gardens. All of this is university, larger university world with the Pantheon right in the middle of it. So the Pantheon has a great big huge imprint right at the top of that mountain, that hill, because of before it was a church. So now it's the Pantheon. And uh, if you're up on the porch of the Pantheon, you just look right straight over to the Luxembourg Gardens. You can see all the greenery and everything and then the other direction you go down the hill to uh, the to Notre Dame so you go down the hill the very street the Lycée sits on Rue Saint-Jacques takes you down the hill down to the bottom and across the bridge to Notre Dame so that's the street that goes right across the front of Notre Dame Rue Saint-Jacques so there's Louis de Grand on Rue Saint-Jacques Rue Saint-Jacques is a very busy, important street because it's sort of the main access boulevard up to the university. So everybody who's down on the level of the island and the river, they're all coming up Rue Saint-Jacques for the university or for this great school. Lycée, as you know, is high school level. This is still the absolute number one school in France. If you're a young person, high school age, this is where your family would like you to go. Um, it was founded by the Jesuits uh, back in the 1500s, so it's, it's part of the great outreach of the Jesuits. As you know, Loyola comes to Paris and studies at the university and then starts dedicating himself to education. Um, and so this is a Jesuit-run uh, lycée, college, and he studies Latin, theology, rhetoric, all the grand old subjects that would be part of a, a, a Greek, Latin, humanistic education. Later in life, he became fluent in Italian, Spanish, and English. That's because he traveled so much, and German too. Uh, he was a brilliant student. So we could guess that. We could guess that because he's phenomenally productive in his years of writing. He writes a huge amount. All of it interesting, important, and different, and in almost every conceivable subject. Scientific papers, novels, books of his letters from England, uh, everything. Uh, theater, play, had, had, the most, had the biggest success of any play on the stage in Paris. So he was able to write everything, really, really everything. Here's his wonderful memory of that education, and any teacher would love to have their student write about them like this. Mm -hmm. I was educated for seven years by men who took unrewarded and indefat indefatigable pains to form the minds and morals of youth. They inspired in me a taste for literature, sentiments which will be a consolation to me to the end of my life. Nothing will ever efface from my heart the memory of Father Poré, who is equally dear to all who have ever studied under him. Never did a man make study and virtue so pleasant. I had the good fortune to be formed by more than one Jesuit of the character of Father Poré. What did I see during the seven years that I was with the Jesuits? The most industrious, frugal, regulated life, all their hours divided between the care they took of us and the exercises of their austere profession. 
I call the witness the thousands of educated by them as I was. There is not one who would belie my words. Yeah. So if you think of all the different people that you've read about going off to school, you know there were some of geniuses who hated school, did badly in school. Winston Churchill who hated school and didn't like. And then there are others like Voltaire, who loved school, was a good student right from the beginning, had brilliant teachers, had a loving home, uh, loved his city of Paris, and so by the time he was 20, he already had journeyed way, way down the road to uh, educational strength. So lucky him. So there's our map again, and then right next to it is the Pantheon, and of course, as you all know, he's buried in the Pantheon. He and Rousseau both are in the Pantheon, and I just put uh, the name of my favorite little part of Paris right behind it, which is Place Contrescarpe. Uh, and I put it there just because it's the hub of that whole neighborhood behind the Pantheon on the top of the hill. Contrescarpe means at the edge of the hill edge. Scarps, and scarpment means it goes down. So Place Contrescarpe sits at the top of the hill that goes down, which is the street going to the south gate of Paris to Rome. So way, way back in the old days, that street that goes down goes down to a gate, which is the, the, the Place de Rome. And so that Place is sort of the hub of this whole neighborhood in behind the Pantheon, uh, restaurants and shops and cafes and all sorts of things in which the great group of expatriates, Hemingway, Joyce, Fitzgerald, all lived and worked and had apartments and, and came to the Place Contrescarpe every day to talk and read and write. And if you read Hemingway's memoirs of living in Paris, uh, you'll, you'll see all about it. He'll tell you what it was like, Place Contrescarpe. Okay. So, when he reached the age, his father uh, insisted that he study law. Uh, first, he was going to study law in Paris, but he played around and had so much fun that his father realized, no, 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 I have to send him off to some provincial city that's boring enough so that he'll have to study law. So he sent him to Normandy, uh, to Cannes, and um, he wrote just as many essays and just as many little articles and things as he'd ever done in Paris. So eventually his father gave up and said, all right, come home, so do something else. And, uh, and so they, they gave up. And he had an opportunity to go off to the Netherlands. So he went to the Netherlands as a secretary to an ambassador to the, to the Hague and uh, fell in love with a lovely French Protestant girl named Catherine. Uh, and also known as, I love her nickname, Pimpette. Don't you love that? Pimpette. But, of course, it became a great scandal because the various members of the diplomatic entourage found out about it, gossiped about it, gossip went back to Paris. Oh my God, terrible, terrible, terrible. Father embarrassed, everybody embarrassed. Bring home your son. Uh, he's scandalizing all the Amsterdam and, and, and Netherlands. And so we all had to come home. So now he's a uh, young man, not quite 20 yet, already has had his first great scandal. So he got started early. He's, 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 into, he's into scandals, uh, and he isn't even 20. So that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yes, precocious, early scandal, early scandalous. And uh, he comes home just as Louis XIV dies.